Okay, successful stewardship, taking good care of God's money. This is lesson number two in this series. And we're going to talk about tithing, something, you know, uh, the topic, everybody has heard of that, but we're not quite sure. Do we do that? Do we not do that? So we're going to talk about that. Uh, various concepts involved in uh, tithing. So last time uh, we talked about motivation and the role that it plays in our giving. Today, as I mentioned, I'd like to talk about tithing and clear up some misconceptions that we may have about this action and see exactly what does the New Testament say about giving and how does tithing, because you know, we hear other people talk about tithing, how does tithing fit into all of this? So last week the point was why we give. This week the lesson deals more with how we give. So a lot of denominations use the word tithing when they refer to their giving of money to the church. They'll say to each other, you know, do you people tithe or how much do you tithe? You know, they, they, they use that word. We don't use it, but they do. Uh, the word refers to the Old Testament practice of giving one tenth of their produce, cattle, everything else to support the priests and the Levites. The word tithe literally means one tenth. And so tithing is the practice of giving one tenth share of something, not necessarily religiously. You know, if you tithe something, it means you give a tenth. Now this practice is older than the law of Moses and it was done by many nations long before it was introduced into the uh, Jewish culture. In Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 20, if you remember the various pagan kings that were in battle, gave Abraham one-tenth of the spoils for having you know, saved their people. When the law was given by Moses, this concept was included as a way of supporting the Levites. And so in Joshua, uh, chapters 13 to 21, obviously we're not going to read that, but in Joshua, in the book of Joshua, 13 to 21, uh, Joshua divides the land and he assigns each tribe a portion of, of land. Um, the Levites, if we read about uh, that uh, action, we find out that the Levites had no land and they were given responsibility to care for the tent of meeting and later on for the temple. So each tribe got a section of land in the promised land. But when it came to the Levites, they didn't get any, they didn't receive any, any land. Their livelihood did not come from the land. Uh, it came in the form of the one tenth given by the nation. And so the priests also lived in this way. And so the Levites, okay, they were the helpers, the, the ones that put up the, uh, the tabernacle. They didn't offer sacrifice. That was the job of the priests. But the Levites, they received the tenth from the people for their livelihood. The priests received a tenth of what the Levites received. And that's how these two groups were supported in the work of caring for the temple, you know, the, that, and also for the sacrificial system that the priests uh, oversaw. So the people were instructed to count out one tenth of their crops, their fruit, their herds, and give it to the Levites. And this was done three times a year. Later on, the overzealous scribes and Pharisees added complex rules that said that even seasonings had to be tithed, even down to stalks and leaves. But this was human law, this was not God's law. This was human beings you know, overdoing it as we are wont to do. The Pharisees uh, said that everything that was eaten, watched over and grown had to be tithed. Again, went way beyond what God had originally said. This, of course, is the type of excess that Jesus accused them of when he said, you know, you tithe, uh, I'll read the whole thing. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill, those are seasonings, right? And, and cumin 
and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting uh, the others. And so because the Jews gave significant meaning to different numbers, uh, this is the reason why one-tenth or 10% was an important symbolic portion to give to the Lord. Uh, in Jewish numerology, various numbers meant various things. Three, for example, represented God. Uh, four, the number four represented the creation. North, south, east, west, number four. Number three and number four together, seven, an important number, represented God and His creation together. And the number 10th represented wholeness, fulfillment, ripeness, readiness, completeness. The number 10 represented that idea in Jewish numerology. So to give 10% was a mature, a complete, a full amount to offer to the Lord. This represented the idea that your gift, your thanksgiving, your offering was itself complete and mature and whole. You gave 10%, the number 10 represented wholeness and, and ripeness, okay? Um, the fact that they gave the first 10% or the first 10% portion of their crops and fruit and herds, uh, which represented their wealth, was done to signify an important idea. In Exodus 19, verse five, we read, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. So in Exodus 19.5, God says that all the earth belongs to Him. It doesn't belong to us, it belongs to Him. Why? He created it. The person who creates it, <laughs> you know, it owns it, if you wish. So we don't own anything. You know, in theological you know, ideas, you know, in legal ideas, we can buy a piece of land and you know, we get a piece of paper, we pay for it, and you know, legally we, we can own it. But theologically, we don't own anything, all right? Um, we don't own anything. We have no just right to use anything because it all belongs to God. The point of giving the first 10% to God was a way of signifying that everything we have belongs to God and the portion given is a way of acknowledging this. By giving 10%, they acknowledged that everything belonged to God. Now, the Jews understood that by giving the first full portion, 10% to God, acknowledging His ownership, God was then permitting and blessing them in the use and the disposal of the other 90%. Now we think, I mean, I'm only talking about tithing here, but just a little side note. 10% was not considered giving. 10% was not considered, you hadn't given anything to the Lord. 10% was tax. You had to do that. You, you haven't really given Him anything yet. You, you started with 10%. That was, that was your tax. That was to acknowledge that God has everything and has given you what you have you give back 10%. And then you had to uh, give another amount for the firstborn. That was also a tax, okay? You, like a, a Christian, you know, he's the firstborn of the family. Well, there'd be a tax uh, that uh, Mauricio and Julia would have to give you know, for the firstborn. That also was not considered giving. You hadn't given anything yet. <laughs> so you've given 10%, then you've given a certain amount to redeem the firstborn, you still haven't given anything, it's only after you've done those two things that, that the next amount that you gave was considered giving something to the Lord in Jewish thinking, okay, according to the law. So I'm not going to go into that too much, I just want to talk about the 10% the and what that uh, signify. Giving 10% to God simply acknowledge that He was God, He owned everything, and he had allowed you to have what you have, and by giving 10%, he was blessing you in the use of the other 90% of what you uh, were given. So the point was that by rights, all of the produce uh, and the herds should have been given to God because it rightfully belonged to him. But by giving him the first full portion, 10% determined a full portion, 
in order to eliminate doubt as to what a proper and acceptable portion was supposed to be, by giving the first 10%, 10 the Jews knew that they had given the right amount. Because otherwise somebody said, well, how much should I give? Should I give 8%, 14%, maybe 14% is not enough. So you know, God settled the matter. The law settled the matter, 10%. That was the right amount to give. All right, so there are many religious groups and denominations who have carried over the idea of tithing into the present time. Okay. Uh, there are even some churches of Christ who carry on this practice. Now, they may be well-meaning, but there's no New Testament basis for tithing today. No New Testament basis for that. We have no instructions from Jesus or the apostles concerning tithing. The concept of giving, or giving regularly, giving generously, even sacrificially, have all been carried over from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but the requirement that each individual's acceptable portion has to be 10%, that has not been carried over from the Old to the New Testament. Now, some people confuse tithing with pledging. We don't do that here, here at the Choctaw Congregation, but I've been at congregations that do uh, pledging. Um, uh, and the way it works is that uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, an individual will put on a piece of paper what they pledge to give for that year. They'll say, you know, they'll think about it and they'll say, well, you know, I make so much, my wife works, she makes so much, we have these bills. So we plan that we're going to give this much money to the church this year. And of course, Lord willing, if everything goes right, if I keep my job and you know, I don't get sick or whatever, uh, if the Lord permits, this is how much we will give. And a lot of churches use a pledging system in order to make their budget. Uh, one of the congregations, that's how, that's how they operated. They, you know, they'd add up all these pledges and they'd factor in you know, extra monies that would be given during the year, and then they'd subtract a little bit for those who couldn't carry out the pledge, you know? and that was the budget. And it doesn't matter if you need this or you need that. You, yeah, the budget was never more than what it was pledged. And that's how they, that's how they, uh, that's how they operate. So there's a, sometimes some debate about uh, pledging. When a member examines his resources, pledges or promises to provide the church a certain amount of money over a period of time. Uh, as I said, this commitment is taken with the knowledge that keeping the commitment is based on whether or not the Lord will continue to provide you know, the resources. If the Lord is willing, a certain amount will be given over a certain amount of time. This type of giving, again, as I mentioned, helps both the person and the church plan their work and financial commitments over a period of time. Now, some people are against pledging because they don't see it in the New Testament. You know, in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul tells them to prepare and set aside a certain amount. Well, you know, that's, a, that's a form of pledging. You know, you're thinking in advance. Some people are against the pledge cards. Um, uh, but again, this is just another way of organizing our giving uh, and our work and our, and our spending. Uh, uh, once again, it's not an issue in our congregation, that's not the way that we do it, but um, uh, some people um, feel very strongly about pledging. Uh, tithing is not pledging. Tithing, on the other hand, is a requirement that each person must give a certain amount to the Lord. And that's the big difference between tithing and pledging. In pledging, you decide based on your income and what you decide that you're going to give, you decide what you're going to offer, period. In tithing, you don't get to decide. The church decides and tells you, you're going to give 10%. And there's the difference. Freedom is, is the difference, okay? There's no choice. Not to do so is a sin. Now, I'm not saying we teach that. I'm just saying in places where, you know, in many uh, denominations, uh, if you don't carry out your tithing, it's a sin. Uh, the deacons will be knocking on your door and come to visit you and say, look, uh, we noticed that uh, you, know, you, you, didn't, you haven't given your tithe in the last month. Is there something wrong? Have you been sick? Uh, did you lose in the stock market? You know, they, follow, they follow this stuff. Again, Strange for us, because that's not been our experience. Uh, okay. 
Uh, tithing, of course, is easier and more profitable for the budget. I mean, if in this congregation, if every single person who has an income gave 10% of that income, our, <laughs> our giving wouldn't be $10,000 a week, it'd be $50,000 a week. So it's a much easier and profitable way of collecting money. The only problem with it is it's not biblical. It's not according to the New Testament. So, you know, that's not how we operate. Uh, there's still giving in the New Testament, but the way we give and some of the reasons we give are different. As far as how one should give, the New Testament has a much more simplified approach to the actual giving itself. First Corinthians, it says on the first day of every week, so that's Sunday, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. So first of all, the, you know, the rule, the, uh, the instructions about giving, number one, we give regularly. He said on the first day of the week. That's why many times the fellows who are brothers who are up there you know, presiding at the communion, they say the communion portion is now over, but this is a convenient time to make the collection. Where do they get that idea? Well, they get it from 1 Corinthians 16 too. Paul says on the first day of the week. You know, make the collection on the first day of the week. So we give regularly. The church provides a convenient time for monies to be collected during weekly worship period on Sunday. Paul is speaking about a special offering here that he was going around collecting for the saints in Jerusalem. But in so doing, he provides the only information that we have concerning the method used to collect funds in the church. So we go with that. One instruction and example in the New Testament is enough, however, to guide our actions. We don't need 10 passages of scripture telling us that on the first day of the week, you know, we should set aside money to, you know, for the church. We have one passage that gives us that instruction. We don't need two or five, one's enough. It's inspired and it's pretty clear in what he's saying. Um, another teaching on giving is each member gives. Every single member is responsible for giving. There's no such thing as a Christian who feels like he or she is not included in the process. If you have income of any kind, on the first day of the week, each week, you should be giving to the Lord, according to what the New Testament teaches. Number three, each member prepares for the gift. And here we're getting into you know, the psychology of it the spirit of the thing, okay? No one tells you what to give. That's a good thing. No one dictates the amount. This is your decision. However, Paul says that it's not a last minute thing. It's not an afterthought. Each person should come with the intention of giving and giving an amount that has been thought about and prepared in advance. Uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, um, uh, Paul, what Paul is getting uh, to here is that uh, uh, the giving of money in the church is a spiritual exercise. So it isn't a spiritual exercise if the plate goes around and goes, oh yeah, yeah, the collection, I don't know, what do I, I got any change on me? You got change? You got, I got a 20 and a five, you know. <laughs> a 20 and a five, which, which one goes in the, you know, that's not, you know, you may, you may and, and you may say to yourself, oh, come on, don't be so cheap, I'll put in the five. But uh, the, the thing is, you end up putting money in a plate, but there's no spiritual exercise there. There's no spiritual benefit there. Yeah, you've helped pay the rent, that's good, but you don't get anything out of that. You get something out of the experience of giving if you think about it ahead of time, if you pray about it, if you, if you, if you review your options, if you think about your blessings you know, and say, you know what, I think I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, whatever, you know, and it's prepared and, and it's given, well then it's given in an attitude of respect and love and there's a spiritual exercise that takes place that benefits the giver. It really, does God need our money? Of course not, but we need the exercise. We need the spiritual exercise of giving in order to help us grow and mature uh, spiritually. 
Uh, fourth principle, you give according to what you have received, you know, according to what is prospered, Paul says. In the Old Testament, the law said 10% of your harvest and your herds in good times and in bad times. They were limited in a way because 10% of a little bit is not a lot. And when you have a lot, 10% is not much to give. If you only make 100 bucks a week, giving $10 is a lot. If you make $10,000 a week, yeah, you can afford it to give 10%. In the New Testament, Jesus liberates us to give generously at all times by tying our giving to our appreciation of what we have. A poor man may feel that he is truly blessed because his family is in good health and he wants to give the Lord a generous portion of what little he owns to show his gratitude, an amount which may be a lot proportionately. A rich man is free to give in excess of 10% so that his giving is meaningful and it's sacrificial, meaning it's sacrificial if you feel it. If you don't feel it, it's not sacrificial. It's only sacrificial if it goes, ouch. <laughs> you know, if it hurts a little bit, then, then, then it's sacrificial. So 10% would be a legal amount, but for the rich man, it wouldn't be a sacrificial amount. And so God is liberating us. He's liberating both the poor man and the rich man to give sacrificially. And the idea is that giving sacrificially is a blessing to the giver. This also helps us deal with the ups and downs of life. I mean, some years 25% of our wealth is given and we still have plenty of money left to live on. When disaster happens, maybe only 3% is the most we can do based on what we have. The New Testament liberates us to grow in good times and bad times with regards to our giving. Now, the rest of this passage shows that in the matter of money, great care was given, that the collection was well accounted for by several in the congregation, and that it was spent on specific needs uh, for the church and ministry, to evangelize, uh, to provide for the poor and the widows, to enable the work of the ministers. I know that there are congregations that feel, well, you, know, you shouldn't give money for a benevolent uh, actions or you, you, you shouldn't send money out to support missionaries and so on and so forth, and I'm not going to debate that issue here. Simply to say that if you look in the book of Acts, you see that churches are involved in all of these activities. They're all involved in evangelism. They're all involved in benevolent work. They're collecting money for uh, uh, victims of a famine in Jerusalem uh, and so on and so forth. So if they can do it in the book of Acts, we can do it today in the, in the 21st century. In addition to this, Jesus taught that when it came to giving, discretion should be the order of the day, not the time for a show. In Matthew 6, 3, right, he says, but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now there are other teachings about giving as far as attitude and the benefits of giving uh, are concerned, but in our lesson I just wanted to look at the how-to of giving. And so here are the basic things on the first day of the week, that's when we do it. I mean, for the church, you're free to help other people and do whatever you want, but as far as giving to the church is concerned, on the first day of the week, each individual uh, gives a prepared amount. And when I say prepared, not just get the check ready ahead of time, but it's thought, it's thought out and it's prayed over. And it's tied to gratitude and not law. That's the beautiful thing about the tithe. By removing the tithe, our giving is based on gratitude and not I have to. It's based on I want to. And that's, that's where it becomes a real uh, blessing to us. So in the New Testament church, when it comes uh, to uh, the giving of money, we see several concrete teachings about the subject. As Christians, we follow and we do what we have been taught and we eliminate all the other things. Important principle here. As Christians, if we know what we are to do, because the Bible gives us instructions, that eliminates everything else. 
You know, when you go to McDonald's and you, you, you order a Big Mac, the girl at the counter doesn't say, so therefore you don't want a quarter pounder, you don't want a, you know, iced coffee, you don't want it. No, by stating what you want, you've eliminated everything that you don't want, right? Well, Bible interpretation works like that too. When, by, when God tells you what he wants clearly, well, it automatically eliminates what he doesn't want. So why do we do it this way? Why do we collect money on the first day of the week? Why do we, each person, why, you know, why don't we do tithing here, even though it might help the budget? You know, why, why do we do it this way? Well, because we've got clear instructions on what to do. And if you have clear instructions on what to do, it eliminates everything else. There's no doubt. So this is why we don't have bake sales or raffles to make money. In Montreal especially, uh, Lisa remembers this, I'm sure, but I get this all the time. It was a young church, meaning they were young Christians in Montreal, just, just converted you know, and coming out of, most of the times, out of denominationalism and Catholicism, so on and so forth. And I always ask some brother, right, you know, some brother or sister, oh, I got an idea at the, at the men's meeting. I got an idea. You know. We're going to have a bake sale. Let's raffle off a car, like a used car. We we'll make a ton of dough, you know. And I'd have to explain to the brothers, you know, no, no, we can't do that. Why? We, it's, everybody would buy tickets. I, at work, everybody would be buying tickets and you know, it's all going to the church. It's a good thing. It was to get across the idea, yeah, but we do things God's way. We, we, don't, you know, we don't do things our way. Important important principle. When the Bible tells us what and how to do something, this eliminates all the other stuff. So every week, each of us contributes a portion of our means according to our wealth. We give it freely and cheerfully, and once given, it is the responsibility of the church to use it wisely in the work of the Lord. All right, so that's just a few comments about tithing and how we give, just to kind of give us some information about that topic. All right, thank you for your attention.